So it occurred to me that in a lot of my videos, I keep saying that I'm a first pressing collector. And yet the topic for so many of my videos is about new editions, right? Or doing like uh, shootouts between new editions and older stuff. And it's been a little while since I've focused on some of those albums that I have in my shelves. And so what I wanted to do today is highlight a musician who I think was underrecorded and you know perhaps not as uh, remembered as he should be. Um, this was a musician who recorded just five albums as a leader and he did them over the course of just two years, 1960 to 1961. Um, and, and that uh, musician is Dave Bailey. So Dave Bailey, the percussionist, the drummer, is who we're gonna talk about today over the course of five albums, a little bit of a show and tell kind of format. So before we dive in, as usual, please hit subscribe, please hit the notification bell and follow me on Instagram at what underscore can underscore brown. All right, so in case you haven't heard of Dave Bailey, or maybe you have, right? Maybe you've seen him in the lineup on some records, but you don't really know that much about him. Um, I kind of wanted to give you the um, a little bit of his background, I guess. So uh, Dave Bailey was born in 1926, and guess, guess what? The man is a living legend. He is 97 years old and still with us. Um, he started playing professionally, to my knowledge, in the early 1950s. Uh, by about 1956, 1955 kind of time frame he was playing quite a bit with Jerry Mulligan um, putting out albums uh, on M MRC under Jerry Mulligan's name um, so let's see I think if, as far as I can tell there's a little bit of a turning point perhaps in 1957 uh, in terms of his career and that was because of his association with Lou Donaldson so uh, Dave Bailey played drums on the album for Blue Note what was it called Swing and Soul which was led by uh, Lou Donaldson. And then Bailey would go on to record on uh, Blues Walk, The Time is Right, um, a couple of others that um, I wanna say maybe Good Gracious to, no, not Good Gracious, Here It Is and uh, Gravy Train as well. So he played on a number of, uh, of, of those albums. He also played on Green Street by, uh, by Grant Green. He played on South American Cookin' by Curtis Fuller on the Epic label, more on Epic in a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, he was, um, yeah, he, he played on a variety of other folks albums but it wasn't until 1960 when he had the first opportunity to play um, as a leader and, and again we're gonna get into that so unfortunately uh, Bailey's career at least in terms of recorded recording music ended in 1969 he retired and he became a flight instructor and, and actually this was actually a, probably a, a good um, you know a good opportunity to leverage his talents because he flew in the Air Force uh, during World War II and so I guess it would be uh, be a natural uh, career decision for him to uh, to then go and become a flight instructor. Uh, to the extent that he stayed close to music, I'm really not sure. So I know that he was involved with uh, Jazz Mobile, which is a nonprofit uh, sort of uh, cultural arts organization focused on jazz education and jazz performance. Uh, this was an organization that I believe was founded by Jimmy Heath and Billy Taylor. Obviously, two other folks who uh, who felt very passionate about um, about uh, educating young people on jazz music. Um, so I know that he was involved with that sometime in the 70s. And otherwise, got to be honest, and I did a little bit of research, I he kind of seemed like he dropped off the radar. I'm not sure exactly uh, what you know what might have happened to him in terms of his career. But again, I do believe that the man is uh, is still with us. So how about that? All right, so let's just kind of go down the line with some of these uh, these albums. See, I think, now don't get me wrong, some of these albums are difficult to find, but what seems to be consistent, at least to me, is that um, a lot of these, you know, perhaps because they didn't press so many, but but just also there there hasn't seemed to be that much attention on them uh, in terms of uh, in terms of reissues, and I and I think it's uh, it's kind of unfortunate. So maybe albums to keep an eye out, or if any of you folks are in in uh, in this uh, this industry and have an opportunity to influence, um, you know, what albums are chosen for reissues, maybe keep these in mind. Um, so let's uh, let's let's dive into the first one. So this is one foot in the gutter. Uh, credited to the Dave Bailey Sextet. And what you can see there um, in the lineup is that you have Clark Terry on trumpet, Curtis Fuller on trombone, Junior Cook on tenor sax, you have Hor Horace Parlin on piano, and Peck Morrison on bass. Um, so this album was recorded in 1960 for the Epic Records label. And this is kind of an interesting format in terms of how they did the actual session. So uh, first of all, there's just three tracks on this entire album. Uh, you have One Foot in the Gutter, um, you have Well You Needn't, which is a uh, Thelonious Monk tune, and then you have Sandu, which is a, I believe it's a Clifford Brown tune. I know he recorded it, 
He probably, uh, he probably composed it as well, but just three tunes. And get this, when uh, Bailey invited everybody to the studio, invited these musicians to the studio, there was no set music. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't have anything on him. It was a more about sort of the spontaneous element of, hey, does anybody have something that we should play? And that's how they basically ran this session. And so um, it, on top of that, they actually had a small audience in the studio uh, to sort of uh, react and, and kind of give the musicians a little bit more of that live feel and hopefully um, sort of spark some additional innovation, right, and, and excitement in their playing. And it really is evident on this uh, on this album. Obviously, each of these tunes are, uh, you know, they stretch uh, quite, quite a bit of, uh, of time, um, given that there's only three on the entire album. There's lots of rooms for solos, and that's why you you know you kind of want to have all of these uh, these these uh, these these horns. I mean, three horns, right? Um, that uh, that have the ability to solo, and obviously uh, all musicians take solos though on this uh, on this album. And and like I said, there's plenty of room for it. So one other quick note: um, this does happen to be an original pressing. Um, obviously, you can see the uh, the demonstration uh, stamp on the back, and then on uh, on the cover, what they did for Epic is they put on these four demonstration um, use only, not for sale stickers. Um, as far as other pressings that you can get, and this did come out in mono as well as stereo, there haven't been that many reissues. So there was one in 1995 by Classic Records. It looks like there was another in 2012 that was just under the Epic uh, label. As far as I can tell, there hasn't been like what I would say like a modern audiophile reissue of this. I personally don't know what happened to the uh, to the to the tapes and whether it's even um, you know sort of wor worthy of that treatment. But in any event, it does still happen to be a, uh, a record that's relatively difficult to come by. All right, so this next one was also recorded in 1960, and the liner notes would suggest that, uh, that the previous one, uh, One Foot in the Gutter, had the opportunity to come out and that reviewers liked it because they kind of referenced that in the liner notes. Um, but this one is titled Getting Into Something. Again, the Dave Bailey Sextet. So slightly different lineup here. We still have, um, who do we still have? Curtis Fuller, uh, Peck Morrison, Clark Terry and Horace Parlin coming along with uh, Dave Bailey, but instead of uh, Junior Cook on the previous one, we have Charlie Rouse. So slightly adjusted lineup. Um, this is also on the Epic Records label. This copy happens to be in stereo. So there was a little bit of a different format with this in that uh, they didn't decide on the spot exactly what, uh, what they wanted to play. I think they did have some rehearsal time. However, one thing that is uh, similar is that despite the fact that this is a studio audience, there actually is a, um, excuse me, a studio recording, there actually is a live audience um, present for the recording. And in fact, uh, they are sort of invited to clap and like, um, and actually participate a little bit uh, with uh, with some of the songs. Um, these aren't quite as, well, it's still long format here. There's, there's only four tracks, so two per side. Um, on this uh, on this album, so still lots of uh, lots of room to uh, to solo and to kind of stretch, and everybody uh, everybody has a turn. And again, it's just a really really exciting album. So as far as the availability of this album, so this is an original stereo pressing. They also put out a mono. Um, Contrast to One Foot in the Gutter, this one didn't have multiple reissues. It just had a single one in 2012 uh, by, by Epic. Um, and I don't know anything about the pressing quality on that one, whether it was sourced from the original tapes, etc. But um, in any event, still uh, remains to be a, a fairly scarce album almost in any format. All right, next up, so this was recorded in March of 1961, and this is probably one of, uh, one of the scarcer, well, I guess there's probably two that are, that are more scarce than, than say the other three. Um, but uh, this one is called Reaching Out uh, by the Dave Bailey Quintet, and this is for the label Jazz Time. Now, Jazz Time only, to my knowledge, put out like three records. There was a Rocky Boyd title that Kenny Dorham played on. There was a Speak Low by, the, uh, by Walter Bishop Jr. Uh, in kind of a trio format. And then there was, um, then there was Reaching Out by, uh, by Dave Bailey. So the lineup on this one includes Frank Haynes on tenor, Grant Green on guitar, Ben Tucker on bass, and Billy Gardner on piano. So quite a different lineup. Um, this one was recorded at the NOLA uh, sort of penthouse studio, which I think was a location that Riverside used from time to time in New York for some of their studio sessions. Um, so yeah, again, you know, a, a very worthwhile uh, title, even though you know, even though it's uh, it's it's really difficult to uh, to, to find. Um, and this one is a little bit different in that there is more tracks. So there's like six tracks here, so there isn't as much uh, opportunity to stretch out. These are a little bit more formal arrangements compared to some of the ones that are almost jam session-y from, from some of those epic titles. So a little bit different, but still just really, really worthwhile. 
So as far as the availability of this album, it's kind of interesting. It's never had a reissue in the US that wasn't credited to Grant Green. So if you're familiar with the album Green Blues was put out for Muse and actually has a picture of Grant Green on the front of it and it's credited to Grant Green, that is this album. So for some reason, when they decided to reissue it, they, uh, they went with Grant Green. Um, so there's never been a reissue in the US uh, credited to, uh, to Dave Bailey, despite the fact that it's a Dave Bailey album. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I think you have to go like maybe uh, find like a Japanese reissue from the early 90s if you want to get one that actually that actually has this cover art. Um, so, you know, again, I mentioned it's scarce, um, you know, and I mentioned this is a little bit of a show and tell. So this is a little embarrassing. I have, so this is a preview copy as well. It says review copy not to be sold. And, um, and you can kind of see, and I'll show you close-ups too. You can kind of see the, um, the label here, which is the, uh, which is the jazz time label. Um, so why, so you may ask why, why embarrassing um, here. So let me show you something. Um, so that's actually not the only copy that I have. Um, so in addition to a promo copy, <laughs> I actually have a test pressing. Um, so what, what you have here is, uh, you know, it's like kind of a rough label and then, um, and then um, like, you know, uh, what, what kind of tape is this? Like, uh, you know, just like packaging tape or whatever that's, um, that's put across it and you can barely read it. But um, in fact, I can't even read it in this light. But in any event, it's a, uh, it's a test pressing of, uh, of this title. And uh, there was an auction for this on eBay a long time ago. And I, um, despite the fact that it didn't come with a cover, I was like, well, I already have a copy of it. And it was kind of at the right price. And so I, uh, I just sprung for it. So anyway, um, yeah, kind of, a, uh, kind of a fun little thing to have. All right, so uh, next one up. This is the other uh, sort, of, uh, sort of scarce one. So this is titled Bash. Uh, again, Dave Bailey sextet, but this time we have uh, Bailey accompanied by Kenny Dorham, Curtis Fuller, Frank Haynes, Tommy Flanagan, and Ben Tucker. This is for the Jazz Line label. Um, Jazz Line is another label that uh, that barely existed. They put out a couple of records. Um, there's one by Duke Pearson, and it's called um, what is it called? I forget what the Duke Pearson one is called. And I have it too. Anyway, there, there's one by uh, there's one by him. There's a I want to say that there's a like a Freddie Hubbard record, but it wasn't released on Jazz Line. And then the session was like sold to another company, maybe Fontana or something, and they put it out. Anyway, um, Jazz Line did not have very many did not have many, very many albums. Um, so on this one, um, well, it was uh, the engineer on it is Peter End. It was also recorded at his studio um, and. I would say that mo most people would think that this is the best album that David B Dave Bailey put out, and I don't think I can disagree. It is absolutely phenomenal, and one of the interesting things too is that despite the fact that it was such a small label and they only put out a couple of titles, they just did a really outstanding job from an engineering standpoint. They all sound amazing. There's just really, really inspired solos on this one. Highly encourage you to go and uh, go and preview it. Um, and unfortunately, that may be one of the easiest ways to hear it because there's never been a U.S. reissue of this title. Now, there have been a few uh, reissues internationally, including one that was uh, credited to Kenny Dorham, and they retitled it uh, Osmosis. That was for the Black Lion label, I believe. But, um, but otherwise, there's never been a U.S. reissue of, uh, of this title whatsoever. Um, and here, I, some, of these, um, some of these small labels just happen to have really, really cool... Um, well, actually labels on the records, I think. And uh, I just really like the, uh, the design on this one. I think it's, it's pretty cool. All right, so this last one, I think is a fitting bookend to our discussion here about Dave Bailey. Uh, here it is. The reason why I say that is because uh, we started with one foot in the gutter. This is two feet in the gutter. Um, so this was also put on, out on the Epic Records label. So that makes three of the five that were put out for Epic. And this was recorded in late 1961. Um, so the lineup here is a little bit different. Again, uh, we have Ben Tucker on bass, um, Billy Gardner on piano, Frank Haynes on tenor, and Bill Hardman on trumpet. Um, so this, you know, it, it doesn't follow the exact same format in terms of that live feel. It is much more of a studio album, but I think is every bit as good as those, uh, as those other titles that he put out for Epic. And unfortunately, again, like those other titles for Epic, the last reissue that we have was put out in 2012 as part of some sort of Epic, I don't know, revitalization or, or I don't know, they're looking at the back catalog or something. And so they decided to put, uh, put them out, but otherwise um, no other opportunities to hear this in the US in terms of a US edition, at least since 2012. 
All right, so um, in conclusion, and here, and actually while I'm kind of doing this conclusion, um, I managed to grab a couple of photo negatives taken by the photographer Burt Goldblatt. Um, I got them a couple of years ago, and so I'll uh, kind of put a, put a few of these up here because actually I believe that they were taken from uh, possibly the same session as one of those uh, one of those epic records was recorded um, just because uh, it kind of looks like he's wearing the same thing it's the same era same like you know exact hairstyle and all that kind of stuff um, so anyway just just a guess but I think that they're um, I think that are pretty cool to see um, but I think what I want to leave you with is that uh, I just think that uh, um, I just think that Dave Bailey's music should be heard and um, again he only put out those five albums as a leader anyway and he stopped recording so early so you know a little bit uh, just feels like there's a little bit of a lost opportunity but at the same time he left behind so much great music uh, especially this stuff as a leader highly encourage you to uh, to check it out and, and maybe we can cross our fingers that at some point there'll be like a box set or something like that right that um, that sort of uh, collates his, uh, his his five sessions as a leader in one and then you can kind of hear them all uh, but uh, in any event i'm a big dave bailey fan love hearing him with lou donaldson love hearing him with grant green and certainly love hearing him as uh, as a leader so hope uh, hope this was interesting uh, maybe we'll uh, make some or maybe i'll make some more uh, more videos about some of these old records um in you know mix them in between uh, some of these that are, that are a little bit more focused on some of the the new modern reissues so i guess i'll leave it at that see you next time